trickling in, but um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to start with handing it over to Sherry Stout, NREL's Lab Program Manager for State, Local, and Tribal Activities, to share a little bit about NREL. Morning, everybody, or afternoon, kind of depending on where you're sitting. Uh, my name is Sherry Stout. As Julia mentioned, I lead our activities with state, local, and tribal governments at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. NREL is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy laboratories, and as the name would imply, we focus most of our work um, exclusively on renewable energy and energy efficiency. So we provide tools, data, technical assistance, platforms, um, as well as research in both the technology of renewable energy and energy efficiency, as well as the social science applications of how we adapt those technologies into the real world and support jurisdictions, communities in adopting those technologies. Super excited about today's webinar. Leads one of our really awesome tools that a lot of communities are using to try and figure out what does energy affordability look like for us? Um, it's one of many tools that we have. So really excited to welcome everybody today. We have campuses in Colorado, um, as well as one up in Fairbanks, Alaska. I really do mean this. If you're ever in Golden, Colorado or Boulder or up in Fairbanks and want to swing by, please let somebody know at the lab. We love to introduce people to technologies also in our laboratories as we are a living lab for people to access. Um, so uh, please let us know. And with that, I will turn it over. Much, Sherry. Great. So we're going to get our first little poll started, and this is just um, for you guys to tell us a little bit about who you are. And so you should see that pop up on your screen. And while you're answering that poll, I'm going to hand it over to Christine Knapp, SCEP Program Manager. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm going to um... Introduce myself. I'm Christine Knapp. I'm the program manager for community innovation and technical assistance in the Office of State and Community Energy Programs. Um, I want to give you a couple slides, but if I do so, I'm going to stop the poll. So why don't you let me know when the, the good time is to stop the poll? I don't want to cut folks off. Looks like sure. we got 76% of folks answering. Maybe you want to get it up to 80% and then we'll stop yeah that sounds good I'll okay just one moment all right yeah I think we're good to go ahead okay great um well I am uh pleased to see that so many folks are here today um for this NRL training on the lead tool um, I am pleased to be the person that helps to coordinate all the technical assistance for the EECBG formula recipients um, and so I just wanna give you a few reminders um, about technical assistance and all that we have to offer you. Um, first of all, hopefully you came here today because you learned about it after you signed up for an EECBG Blueprint cohort. Um, but if you have not uh, signed up for a Blueprint co cohort, it is not too late. You can still do that. And there's a simple way to do that here. Um, so please feel free to, to follow that link and go sign up for one or more uh, cohorts that may be helpful to you in using your EECBG funding. Um, there are additional webinars that we have coming up in the, in the next couple of months. Uh, the next one is on the state and local planning for energy tool or slope tool. Um, this is a really helpful tool. Uh, even if you already feel like you understand a lot about your community, it's still really great to dig into some of the data there and look at decarbonization strategies for a community and understand how that data can uh, play into your ECBG project and planning. Um, so I really encourage folks to attend that one no matter where you are in, your, uh, in the development of your project uh, and your use of the funds. Um, there's also gonna be another blueprint cohort session on uh, project planning sort of a 101 entry level for how do you develop your plan for using your ECBG funds um, and some you know case studies and examples and you can give feedback and find out where else you could use some support so we can continue to set up uh, trainings that are helpful to you. Um, a couple of other quick reminders before I pass it back to the team. If you haven't yet filled out your pre-award information sheet, we really encourage you to do that as soon as you can. Um, the, one of the reasons why is because once we see a little bit about what you are planning on doing in your pre-award information sheet, it help, helps us better create these sort of support networks for you and make sure that we've got the technical assistance you need. Um, but also it helps you take your next steps so that you're not 
holding all those steps to the very end, end of the deadlines, right? So as soon as you get your pre-award information sheet, uh, you'll get an invitation to sign up and page and take all the next steps you need to get the, your funding. Um, so make sure that you're aware of those timelines for the grants that the deadline is, uh, you know, they are coming up. And if you are uh, a location that's interested in taking uh, advantage of the voucher opportunity instead of the direct grants, um, we do have a voucher handbook and templates right now. The application for that is not yet open, but you can take a look at all of the information that will be required for those ap that application when it's open so you can get ready for that now. Another reminder that we have um, open applications right now for our Community Energy Fellows Program. So basically you can get a DOE-sponsored staff person embedded in your community for 18 months to help you implement your EECPG project and increase the impact of the project. Um, so hosts are host locations that will house these uh, fellows. Are Those applications are due October 4th. So please get your applications in if that would be helpful to you. And knowing what we know, about what you've all said about local capacity to deliver. This should be something that we hope it helps folks with um, having that capacity. Uh, lastly, don't miss out on technical assistance from NREL. Besides today's great support, they also are providing support on building out your energy efficiency and conservation strategy or your EECS document. That's a required piece of your application submission. And if you wanna get 10 to 20 hours of help filling that out and understanding sort of what's the best strategy for you to focus on, NREL is there to help. So please make sure you're taking advantage of that um, opportunity. Um, and just a quick recap of some supports for you. If you have questions about your pre-award information sheet, your application, your eligibility, voucher information, et cetera, there's the email address there, the ECBG at HQ email address. If you have questions about blueprints or the cohorts or the fellowship or any other technical assistance, there's the technical assistance email address. And then again, for that EECS um, conservation strategy support from NREL, that's the email address you send that request to. Um, and so with that, I think I'm sending it back to the team. Thank you so much. And I hope that this is a successful session for you all today. Awesome, thank you so much, Christine. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Aaron Vimont. He is a web application developer at NREL, where he's worked here for the past six years. He specialized in data visualizations, data storage, and GIS applications. Aaron believes in data-driven decision-making and the importance of equity and justice, especially in our modern energy environment. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia, and welcome, everybody. Glad to be presenting on this today. It's always a good opportunity to share the lead tool. As Julia said, my name is Aaron Vimont, pronouns are he, him. Um, and so I'm going to start in with just a few slides about the uh, lead tool itself, and then we'll go into a demonstration as well. And I believe, Julia, we have been able to share a document that others can follow along with, and I will be following some of those examples in that document. So um, as we're going through the slides, if people want to open up that document, um, please feel free to do so. But otherwise, I'll be taking us through uh, a demonstration of the tool to give everybody a good understanding of what it's capable of. So to start off with, we can just ask the question, what is the lead tool? Um, there's kind of four main principles that we think of with it. We have uh, discover, modify, understand, and create. So discover is just to understand a little bit or discover a little bit more about your community that you're living in, what data is there um, and what you can do with that. Modify is that you can start modifying some in inputs to match needs that you would have, whether that's an income level, whether it's a certain housing type, a single family home versus a multi-unit building. And then from there, as you've modified this data, you can get a better understanding of some low income characteristics in your communities, and hopefully you'd be able to use that data to create other energy strategies and programs. So why use the lead tool? Uh, the lead tool provides a graphic representation of energy burden and costs, and we'll see this in our demonstration a little bit more, but the idea behind that is it's a lot easier for users uh, in state and local entities similar to the ones that we had. I think in our polling that we saw, there was a majority of people in, in, in uh, local governments. Um, and so 
you can quickly find some geographic representations of areas that might have higher energy costs or energy burden or fit some other criteria that you have. You can also compare geographies. So this allows you to see data side by side for two different regions and uh, two or more regions, I should say. Um, and we will see an example of that as well. Um, but you can also compare totally different geographic entities together. So you can compare a county to a census tract or you know, a county to a city, things like that. So there's ways of, of comparing different geographies directly to each other. And then this should allow people to see some inequities in different regions and uh, observe some of these disparities across different income groups, borders, state borders, county borders, et cetera. So we want people to use the lead tool as a starting point so you can find some of these areas and make more informed decisions about energy programs and energy strategies based on that. Just a little background about the lead tool. It was originally created as what was called the Celica program, the Clean Energy for Low Income Communities Accelerator. You have to have an acronym if it's going to be any governmental program. Uh, so this one was Celica and it was aimed to, to lower energy bills uh, in low income communities. And it was just a two year voluntary partnership, but the lead tool was created as part of that originally as an Excel spreadsheet, just so that users had data that they needed in order to make some of these decisions. And the information that's in the lead tool is I've, I've hinted at this a little bit already, but we have national, state, county, tribal, and city data. Um, and this underlying data is all at the census tract level. We also have data broken down into area median income and state median income at the levels of 0 to 30%, 30 to 50, 50 to 80, 80 to 100, and 100% 100 plus. As just a note on that, we are planning on tweaking these some to match a little bit more of some of the requirements that are in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so that will include AMI of zero to 150% and 150% plus. So we will be adjusting these in the future just so people are aware to make it a little easier to find areas that may or may not qualify for some of the programs uh, in those bills. We also have uh, data broken down by households at the federal uh, in groups of the federal poverty level. So you can see those here. Uh, we also have, this is all based on uh, the housing units themselves. So we have the tenure, whether it's rented or owned, uh, the year that the building was constructed, the number of units in the building, and then the primary heating fuel type. And then for energy burden, this is calculated as a percentage of the energy expenditures to the energy, excuse me, to the whole uh, income of the household. So um, whatever you're spending on energy costs is calculated as a percentage based on your income. Um, and then we do have all 50 states, the District of Columbia, uh, Puerto Rico and tribal nations in here as well. We also have added in demographic data as well as educational attainment data. And those are at the individual level, not the household level. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we see some examples in the tool. Uh, so just a little bit more information uh, here before we get started is the uh, lead tool data is based on the Census Bureau's American Community Survey that happens every year. Um, but we're using the five-year average that they put out. Um, so now we have 2015 through 2020 currently. There is a planned update to use 2022 data when it is released in early 2024, according to the Census Bureau's website. Um, and then we do have some other utility forms that it's calibrated against to make sure that this data is um, still in, in a uh, realistic standing of what people are actually spending for their energy costs. So with that, I think we're gonna do one more quick poll. And after that, I will jump into a demonstration. So Julia, are you able to start that poll for us? Yes, there we go. So give folks a, a few minutes to answer this um, and hopefully the lead tool can start helping us answer these questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop the link to the guide in the chat again. And this is going to be, um, you can go to this box link and download the guide from there. That's just going to help you follow along. And I will also drop the link to the lead tool. And I saw somebody asking, and these are recorded, so we will be able to share these with you at a later date. And um, yeah, make sure that you include your questions in the Q&A section. 
Um, that way we'll have a good record of them and be able to answer them at the end. All right. Well, I think we're getting uh, pretty close to our uh, capacity here for our poll. So I'll leave it there, but it looks like a lot of people are answering a rough idea of what energy burden is and no idea what your energy burden is, which honestly is completely normal because if I had to point it out exactly for my community, I wouldn't know. Uh, but then we have the lead tool that can hopefully help with some of this. So I'll go ahead and end the, maybe go ahead and end this poll. And um, now we'll jump into our demonstration. So um, now I'm just going to start with a little bit of walking around the lead tool, and then we will, oops, I see my video might be frozen. Can everybody still hear me OK? OK, looks like it got back. Um, I'll just do a quick uh, walk around of the tool, and then we'll start walking through some of the, the dem, uh, some of the lists that we have for our demonstration. So uh, here it is, the, the tool itself on energy.gov. When you first come to the tool, you will see uh, the zoomed out view of the United States, we just kind of start at the highest level. And then from there, we can start delving into more data. But before we do that, let's just look at some of the options that we have on the tool. On our left hand side here, we have our filters. I mentioned these some in the slides, but this is where we have things for area median income. We have our building age, etc. So we have various filters that we can do here. As we change these filters, it adjusts the data that shows up on the tool. Um, we can also just minimize this if we need to, to make it a little smaller if you want to start maximizing the space that you're viewing. Um, similarly, on the right hand side, there also is this space that you can minimize if you need to. But on the right hand side, you can see here we have our legend. This will adjust as you move around the map and more data is loaded or if you change the output that you're looking at. So in the case, we're looking at energy burden. So it's in percentages. Um, but as that changes, you'll, you'll see the, the legend change as well. I mentioned a little bit in the slides that we have some comparisons that we can do. And in our demonstration, we'll showcase that. But this is empty for the moment until we actually have some items in there to compare. And then below that, we have our charts here. This is a way of delving into the data in a little bit more detail than you can get on the map. Um, and we will also, again, all this will be in our, in, fully in the demo, but just so you know, you can expand and hide the chart here. So you can kind of have a full view where you get to see everything and then just this minimized view. So you can kind of see the data update as you move around the map. And then at the bottom of the screen, these are kind of our main controls for the map itself. Uh, here we have the different regions that we can select that we talked about in the slides. We also have different output layers that we can use. So this is things like energy burden, energy cost are the two that we've talked about most often. But we also have the number of households, the income, and then also as mentioned in the slides, we have outputs for different demographic groups here as well. And the highest educational attainment as well here uh, at the bottom of it. Um, Next to those, we have a section that are masks. Uh, this is maybe a little bit more of an advanced feature, but this is just a way to start hiding and showing things on the map as you uh, drag those sliders around. If there's data that you want to hide or show only a small, sub small subsection of. We also here have our settings. This is things like adjusting the opacity, um, as well as a few other options that we will get into as well. Um, we have, in addition to a map view, we have a list view. So this is, as you would expect, just like a table of the data. So rather than seeing it on a map, you can just view, go through the data here and just see it in a listed out format. Um, and the last thing that I'll show here is we do have a section for downloads. You can always uh, download images of the lead tool and the data from the lead tool. So if this is something that you need to include in a presentation or would like to do so, you can download images uh, of the map and the data that comes from the map, as well as it also can be done for the charts too. Um, there is an option to do bulk downloads, which, I'll which I can showcase towards the end. Um, but that's a way just to download like all of the data for a whole state or something like that at once. So we can we can get into that. So with that, um, we have, uh, I'll start walking through just some of the examples that we have in the document that Julia shared with everybody. So 
we're going to just start through some of the questions that we might want to ask that the lead tool can help answer. So if we start with question one here that we have on our sheet, we ask the question, what is the energy burden in the Golden, Colorado area for low income households built before 1980? Right. This is just an example of maybe this is something that you might need to do. Ask a question similar to this is what is the energy burden for this area? Golden, Colorado, as uh, Sherry mentioned at the beginning, is where the National Renewable Energy Lab is. So we'll be using that for our examples. But keep in mind, you know, this all of the all of the uh, instructions that we're doing here apply to anywhere in the United States or on this map as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and zoom in slowly here. Um, as I zoom in, I just can see I'm, I'm looking at Colorado. Um, and then I just happen to know roughly where the, the golden area is. I keep zooming in and now I can see golden here. So this is at the state level. You can see energy burden for Colorado is at 2%. So this is not giving me a ton of information. So rather than looking at this big zoomed out level, I will instead switch over to census tracts. And now I'm looking at the most granular data that we have in the lead tool itself. So this will, this will bring up uh, using all the same filters that were applied before to the state level. Now we're looking at all this for the census tract level. You can see here our legend is updated slightly. We haven't modified our data too much yet, um, but the legend has updated with that. So here we are seeing Golden, Colorado. And then I want to uh, adjust my data. So I'm looking at what I would say are low income households. Now, this might depend on what your definition will be for low income. In this example, I'm just going to do people who are below the area median income. So they're below half of the income for the area where they are. So in that case, I'll just go over here to my filters and I'll uncheck 100% plus. You'll see the data adjust accordingly. The map will reload and you can start moving around with the data there. But as we see, as we start removing the highest income households, we see a pretty big change in our energy burden right away. Um, similarly, part of the question that I asked originally was, what is uh, the energy burden for homes that are built before 1980? So here in my filters, I have building age. We have a list here of before 1940 going up to 2010 plus, but I'm going to remove these last three categories because that should get us up to 1980. So for homes that were built before 1980, now we're looking at the energy burden at the census tract level in the Golden, Colorado area. So as that uh, finishes here, that. I have a quick question in the chat. Sure. Um, so oh, yeah. they don't have the bottom toolbar on their map. Um, they, my guess would be is you just sort of need to scroll down a little bit on the side. So if you scroll all the way down, you should see this black uh, footer on the energy.gov page. And if you kind of stop. Oh, it looks like they found it you should be able to see it. Totally understandable when the page first loads, it's a little bit hidden. So if you scroll down, then you can kind of get the, the full experience there. Um, okay, of course, happy to do that. So uh, let's, So now we're answering that first question that we had, of uh, what's the energy burden for this area? So we start, we start just moving around here. We can see that uh, some of these have higher energy, some of these census tracts have higher energy burden than others. Um, it's just helping us understand a little bit more what's going on in these areas. In particular, if you're not that familiar with Colorado, um, there's a big set of mountains that runs down the middle of it. And if you can't tell, the mountains start right about here. So we have a bunch of smaller census tracts with higher population levels. And then as we move into the mountains, we get a little bit more rural. Um, we start having larger census tracts because the population is more spread out. Um, but by happenstance, just as we're discovering this, those areas seem to have a little bit higher energy burden than areas that are uh, more within the bounds of a city, so to speak. So that's just step, that's one option that we have, right? So we can look at that data and see, uh, see what's visually going on where we are. Um, one thing that I do also wanna point out is you can click on an option here on the map um, any geographic region you can click on, and it will show you a little bit more data about it. So here we have our census tract in Jefferson County, Colorado. Um, I can see the households, energy costs, the number of households and the income. And if I, if I click over, you can start seeing the demographics of this uh, census tract. 
And once more, you can see some of the educational information about the census tract as well. So that's just a way to delve in a little bit deeper into the data without having to do too many clicks. You can just see it right there on the census tract itself. Um, so one of the um, other options that we have here too is you don't just have to look at uh, energy burden. If we want to, we could switch this to energy cost. Um, we can see that our legend changes here. And as we move around, we start seeing energy costs for these areas. Um, and so we are noticing again, this trend that these census tracts that are a little bit more in the mountains seem to have a higher energy cost. And then we can also go, if we go back, we can see that some of them also have a higher energy burden. So that's just starting to give us a little sense of, okay, maybe these rural communities have a little bit more, slightly lower income and slightly higher energy costs. Uh, might be something we would consider if we're making a program uh, you know, for, for this area. Uh, I'll go ahead and just switch back to energy burden since that's just a pretty common statistic, uh, data point that we use. Um, but to answer or to ask a similar question along with this data is what types of buildings experience the highest energy burden? This is now jumping to question two in our document that we have here. And this is where we can get into the charts for the tool. So as I showed at the beginning of the demonstration, we can expand our charts here and start seeing a breakdown of the data. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is I have area median income. That's just by default is what's selected as my x-axis. Um, and because I do not have 100% plus listed in my filters, it's excluded from our charts. So this is just to say that the filters that you do uh, affect the data in the charts on the map and also in this table list view that we have as well. So just keep that in mind as you're as you're going around it. But uh, another option that we have on the chart is not to just look at the area median income, but we have some of these other filters that we can break the data down by. So rather than doing AMI, I'm going to switch to building type. And now I can see here for all the building types that we have, I can look at the energy burden for those. So I start just kind of moving my cursor along here to see what we're dealing with. So it's looking like some of these one unit uh, one unit detached and one unit attached, so those are single family homes, um, has a slightly higher burden than some of these multi-unit buildings, right? Um, then as we scroll over to, we also are seeing pretty high energy burden for, po for folks in the mobile and trailer bracket as well. So this isn't uh, a dramatic difference necessarily between these, but you can just start seeing a little bit of the data and understanding that individual units, individual homes seem to have a higher energy burden for what we're currently viewing here on this map. And these multi-unit ones are showing a little bit less. Um, the other options that we have here is we have our X, or excuse me, our Y axis on energy burden. Um, but again, we can switch that. Uh, this is just energy costs. So again, we're looking at one unit detached homes having the highest cost, which just logic dictates makes sense. Um, when you have all of your walls surrounded by heat or cold, you're going to have a little bit higher energy costs to heat that building versus ones with shared walls and things like that. Um, the chart also does show uh, a little bit more of a breakdown of the data. So you can see here we have gas, electricity, and other as costs. Um, and I apologize, I didn't highlight that in our uh, energy burden as well, but we do have that. So we have the cost broken down by electricity, gas, and other. Um, as you might expect for most places, electricity and gas are usually the highest ones and other will be other brackets. That would include things, maybe people who use uh, wood burning as their main heating source. Other would be their costs of like getting wood and things like that. Um, so next, uh, so that just shows a little bit of kind of what the tool does at a little more of a higher level. We're looking at the, the map now, we're looking at this whole area, but as we talked about, one of the advantages of the lead tool is that we can compare regions together. So for the moment, I'm gonna just go ahead and minimize this and head back over to the, head back over to the map. Um, I'm just gonna use two census tracts as an example. But keep in mind, again, this can be applied to anywhere that, that's on the lead tool. But if I go ahead and click here on Jefferson County Census Tract 9858, um, I see this little green option to compare, 
Oops. If my screen hasn't frozen, there it goes. Got a lot of stuff going on. My computer's very toasty at the moment. Um, so uh, now I can see that I added this uh, option here to my comparisons. Uh, and then I will go ahead and add a second census track here so I can start seeing them side by side. So in this case, I'm just going to go to census track 9854. So these two are side by side, but seem to have some different uh, energy burdens and energy costs. So I will do a comparison on that one. Um, and then the last thing that I will add to this is that I don't necessarily just want to compare a census track to a census track. I might want to view it compared to the county as a whole. So in that case, I'm actually going to switch back over here and say, rather than looking at census tracts, I'm going to jump to counties. Now I see that Jefferson County is the one that I was looking at before. So we will add Jefferson County as our third comparison option in this example. So now that these are compared, I can jump back over to my chart and I can start seeing some of this data side by side. So the first thing that you might notice here is that we're, there's not really data for census tract 9858 for any of these other units. So we start understanding that that census tract has almost exclusively one unit detached homes. Now that I will say that doesn't mean it's that's only the case. Keep in mind that we're dealing with survey data here. So there may be some that aren't included in there, but it's at this point we have in the lead tool, there's little enough data that we're seeing uh, for other units in this in that one specific census tract. There just aren't enough housing units to justify having that data in, in the tool because one unit couldn't represent that whole census tract. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind here as we observe some of this data. However, we can again start breaking this down differently. Um, we can look then, we'll just go back to area median income as an example. So we can start seeing for people who are in the zero to 30 AMI bracket, so the lowest income people, uh, the, uh, actually, excuse me, one moment, I'm just gonna switch this back to census tracts so we can view this uh, together and you can see what I'm showcasing. So this is our census tract here. Again, it's looking a little bit more rural, um, but this has the highest energy burden for this low income bracket compared to all the others. So if we're looking at making programs, again, this might be something to say this census tract, we know that it has a high number of single unit homes. We know that those people in the lowest income bracket have the highest energy burden. And now we know where we might want to focus our efforts on the most if, if we're gonna build a program in this region. Uh, so that's uh, one option that we have there as well. I do also want to showcase that you can break this data down a little bit more, and we'll show some of that. But just as an example, if we wanted to break this down further into like renter and owner, which I'll just do as this example, um, so it doesn't get too cluttered. Again, we start looking at this and see the breakdown of now zero to 30% uh, for renter versus owner, and then here's 60, 30 to 60 for renter versus owner, et cetera. So the data breaks down in a little bit more detail. Again, we start seeing an answer to the question of who do we need to focus on? Um, we don't really have renters in this area or a small enough amount that we might want to instead focus on owners. Um, at least as for the data that we have, we, we know this a little bit more and it gives us a little more of a clear answer as to where we want to go um, going forward. So I'll go ahead and just remove that for the time being, just to simplify what we're showing on the screen and not overwhelm folks too much. Um, but now we'll jump into kind of the last section that we have of this uh, kind of guided demonstration, which is uh, how do we, uh, so, excuse me, uh, where can energy programs and outreach you know, benefit households that experience the highest energy burden? So in some of our, uh, Examples, we've been answering that question a little bit more. I got a little bit ahead of my policies. I practiced this and got to get to the question. But uh, so we've been delving down into the data in a little bit more detail. So we've been looking at the census tracts. We've been able to compare them side by side with a county. Um, and then if we need to, and this is just showcased in this example, uh, we can download a little, we can download this if we want to share this uh, information with other people, like I said, so we can download the map data uh, and it will show for the census tracts that are visible on here. Um, 
it will save it. It will save it as a CSV format, which is comma separated values. Essentially, you could just open it in Microsoft Excel. Um, so I'll, I'm pulling that up here as an example. Um, you can see the uh, geography, the name, and then the information about it here. Um, and so then you can actually use this data yourself if you're so inclined. Um, the other option, as I mentioned before, is you can download an image of this. Um, and one thing that you will notice in here is that it will download two images. So one of them is the legend and one of them is the map. So that way you can put them into, my computer stops freezing on me. You can put those into separately into a presentation if you need to. Um, so you can see both of those there as well. Uh, okay, and lastly, we'll jump into the question of what have what uh, housing types have the greatest energy burden for minority or underserved populations. So this is going to get into a little bit more of the some advanced features of the tool. Um, and the, but there is a way that we can group things together for content that is meaningful to us specifically. So in this example, I'm going to group some of our layers together by demographics. So if I click on this map region section and I open up our layers, I can see here for demographics that I can group them together. So for uh, this example, and I think a lot of uh, programs around the, the country might be focusing on non-white populations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just dragging and dropping the non-white populations, excuse me, into a, a group. So here I have Black African-American, American Indian, Native Alaskan, uh, Asian, Native, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, and then white, Hispanic, or Latino. Um, so I'm leaving the white, non-Hispanic or Latino out as whether two or more or other, just for this example. But in this one, you know, we could call this non-white or something like that, uh, and we can save. And then as that gets changed, I can now use this around the tool. So if I go here to the non-white population, we can see, uh, I mean, uh, in some of these more mountainous rural areas where they can get no white population but, or, or no non-white population potentially are very small versus the more populated areas of the city. So this is just a, an additional feature that the, that the lead tool has. You can kind of group things together as, as you see fit. And then if we want to start uh, comparing these together a little bit more or looking at this with other data, excuse me, um, I'll go ahead and expand my charts again here. And for we're going to start looking just at this area as a whole. So I'm actually going to remove my comparisons, which you can do just by uh, deleting them off of here. And then the data goes back to viewing the map as a whole. And that's what we're seeing now in the chart is the data for the whole area that we are looking at. Um, and again, we're going to go back to our example of looking at building types. And we see our energy burden here. But then we can go into our, our uh, y-axis and we can have one that shows energy burden. And the second one, we can go down here to our custom group that we made for a non-white group. And that now shows up on our chart. So as we hover across this, we not only see the energy burden, but then we can also see in this case, the, in this example, the percentage of the non-white population. So again, going back to maybe answering some of the questions that we had of where do we need to focus our, our efforts for a energy program, energy strategies. So looking at this, uh, if we wanted to focus on higher non-white populations, then we might focus a little bit less on, uh, or higher, uh, excuse me, hi higher non-white populations with uh, higher energy burden, we may focus a little bit less on these multi-unit buildings and could focus more maybe on some of these two-unit or one-unit detached buildings. Um, and again, we can also see here there is a decent uh, population and a higher energy burden for folks that live uh, in mobile homes and trailer homes. Um, so that would be a place we could, we could look as well. So uh, with that, I do I want to show just a few more things so we can see some examples um, and I'll leave it open for questions and I'll try to preempt a few questions as well. Uh, but 
Just similarly, I wanted to show that yes, you can group demographics together. You may have seen this, but you could also group uh, your filters together. So if in this case, you want to do area median income and you just wanna have a different group for like low and medium income versus high income or something, you can do that as well. Um, so this might be low income, we might call this median income, and then have the others here. And save that. Well, I apologize, there was a small bug with that. So uh, something to fix, of course, a demo is how you find bugs. Um, so thank you for your patience with that. But um, that is something that you can do as well. You can group filters together, and then similarly, you can group comparisons together. I'll pull up the two that we had previously, and I'll just do a third one as an example. So I have these three here, um, but if I needed to, I could group two of the census tracts together, and this might be something we would call rural, and the other ones might be urban or something like that. And you can save those and then see that data uh, side by side with it. So you just, you see your rural group together and then your separate group next to it. So there's ways of combining data, barring some of the bugs that we just saw, um, to, to make it a little bit more useful uh, as, as you all see fit, as you go ahead and use the tool. Um, then the I'll show just two more things here. The first one will be uh, if you want to download data for like a specific region and you don't want to get it all on the map, you can go into our table view here, uh, which is down on the bottom towards the right. Um, and here again, you can see all the same data that's on our map, but it's just grouped by state, county, et cetera. So in this case, I can go to counties. Um, and if I want to, I can filter by, I'm just gonna use Colorado as our example, cause that's where we've been. So now I can see the counties in Colorado and just see the states and uh, just see the data for that. And then if I want to, I can also go into census tracts and you can see now Colorado is still selected, but I can even filter out the counties that we're in. So in our example, we were looking in Jefferson County. So I can look now at just the 146 census tracts that are in Jefferson County. Um, the same is true for kind of any of the regions that we have up here on, on the top. Um, and then the last thing that I will show is you do have an option is there was like a bulk download, right? So if I wanted to download this, I can now. Um, so if I go ahead and click on download data, you'll see a message. It might take a few minutes because it has to spin this up and it's going to be collecting and downloading the data for you. Um, in this case, this was a super quick one because I'm downloading such little data, but sometimes it might take a few minutes. Um, but if that's the case, then I can just go ahead and click here. Um, it'll download a version of the file. It has that all listed up here. Um, and you can see now, these are all of the, uh, all the information for each of the census tracts. We have the state, the county that they're in, energy burden, household costs, et cetera, as well as all of the other data that's associated with it. Um, and at the top of this, you will see uh, a list of filters that was used for it. The um, other thing you may have seen here is this little flag for disadvantaged community. I'll go ahead and uh, just change counties here to see if we can get a good example of that. So um, a disadvantaged community comes from the CGEST tool. This is another data from, uh, oh boy, the Department of Energy. Sorry, can't remember where that one came from at the moment. Um, but we have, and you may have noticed this uh, in some of the settings, but we have added uh, an option to show disadvantaged communities. So these are census tracts. Um, there's a little bit more information here, but there was a bunch of criteria that went into this and census tracts were deemed to be a disadvantaged community or not. So we have that data in the lead tool as well. If you turn that on, um, you'll see a little icon here in the legend, and then all of the census tracts that are marked as disadvantaged uh, are have gray uh, lines on them in the map. Um, and if you click on this one, you can see here, it says disadvantaged community and also has the little uh, information icon that we can share. Um, and you may also have noticed that in some of my examples we have is disadvantaged community is set to true or false uh, in the exports as well. So you can see that just a little bit more data that can be provided to you. Um, and then I will also uh, 
showcase. So a couple of things, we have some boundaries that we can show. So we can put county boundaries on here, uh, city boundaries, et cetera. So it just gives you a way to kind of visualize your data a little bit more. Like let's say if you happen to know, you wanna focus on certain counties, census tracts in certain counties or others, then you can do that. You can add the boundary there just to make it a little more visible for you. Okay, last thing I will do. I got a lot to show. Uh, is there is a share option with the tool. So if I do this and I copy it, this will keep track of where I am on the tool and what I've been looking at, and you can share that with other people. So in this example, I'm just gonna go to a different browser and I'll go ahead and paste it in. Um, and it will load up the tool as we saw it before, um, except it has all of the things that I had selected previously. So it has the filters I've been using, it has uh, the comparisons that are in there, it has the map that's being used, et cetera. So, um, that is a way too, if you're working on this and you want to share it with a colleague or coworker or someone else, you can and say, hey, here's what I'm looking at. Here's the data that we have. Um, okay, so with that, I'm sure there are lots of, uh, you know, there could be questions and things. Uh, the one that I will preempt and jump in on here is you may notice there are some of these that, that have uh, no data. There can be a couple reasons for that. The first one is that the Census Bureau just doesn't have data for it. It's possible. So if we want to look at a good example of that, um, if I lower the opacity here, you can probably see it. But two areas that are black on the map here are the Rocky Mountain Wild, this Arsenal Wildlife, Ref, uh, Wildlife Refuge and Denver International Airport. So while that is a census tract, there's probably very few people that actually live there. And so there's just not much data and therefore we don't have it in the tool. The other thing that can happen with this is that uh, as you filter data, um, you start excluding values from here. This should be, oh, now this one showed up. Well, there you go, found another bug. Um, but if I start doing a lot of filtering on the tool, on, excuse me, pulling in a lot of filters, uh, on the tool. So I'm looking at just a tiny percentage of uh, some of the area median income, or I'm looking at uh, just a tiny, like only buildings built before 1940. It's possible there's no data for that, right? So as we saw in some of our examples, when we were looking at the chart, that there was no data for that one rural uh, census tract that we saw. So in that case, if we start trying to filter the data down by stuff that's not there, it's gonna show up as just no data. And the last option is it's it's possible there's a mistake in here. So if there's something where you feel like there should be data for this and there's not, you know, that uh, we have no hard feelings about people saying, hey, let's look into this and see what's going on because we're dealing with a lot of data and its potential. There was a small bug or something like that that caused it to be there. So if you see these black areas, um, there may just be you no know, data that's available for them. Um, and if you think that's you know, an error or something, we can certainly look into that. So with that, we have uh, just a few minutes left for questions. Sorry, it's a long demo because there's a lot to show. So I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, but uh, yes, so I will leave it there and see um, if we have, are there any questions, I guess? I think, I'm not sure if folks are just able to do it through the Q&A or if we can unmute. Um, I'm not sure what the settings are off the top of my head, but uh, feel free to shoot questions over or you know comments or anything else. Couple in the chat, and I think you showed us that um, share feature, which is great. Um, someone was asking, how do we save the comparisons and groupings? Is there a place to create a login? Um, no, we don't have a login for this. So when you so in this, I'll. Uh, Go back to here to my other browser that I have. It will remember, uh, it should remember where you were last time you came to the tool. Um, so if I uh, refresh this, it should keep what I had there. But the right now there isn't a login. Logins get complicated. Uh, so there isn't a login option for this. But again, if you do have the share option or you just want to keep that for yourself and say, I want to look at like this old one, that would be the way to do it. So it's a little bit old school, but yeah, you, you can save. Uh, either through a bookmark or just you know copying it yourself. You could save where you were in that way. Um, all right, I'm gonna scroll down through the chat here. Yeah, well. it looks like we have one other in the chat at least. Yeah, I see, sorry, um, bottom, save comparisons. The average energy costs include customer account charges, taxes, management, late fees, or just the fuel and electricity costs because it seems very low. Um, 
that's a good question. I uh, don't know uh, off the top of my head. I didn't originally create this data set. I did build the tool, um, but my understanding of it is it's just the energy costs. So it's not necessarily all the taxes and other things that are associated with it because I know, do know that changes over time as well as we all do thanks to our energy bills. So I believe it's just the energy cost and not all the other fees and extras on top of it. Um, I believe I saw one other question as well from Roger. We have, uh, does household include multifamily units? So yes. Uh, well, it depends on maybe a little bit on what you're asking if you need to clarify it. But when we are talking about, uh, in the example on the tool here, uh, you know, we have building type. So this would be, you know, our multifamily unit. So if you want to focus on only, uh, you know, multifamily and anything that's not one unit, then yes, you can go ahead and do that and uh, view, view the data in that format and you can see it adjust um, accordingly. Oh, sorry, I'm still on my other view. I'll go back to energy burden here so we can see some of that. Okay, uh, well, it looks like that, if there are other questions, please feel free to uh, uh, keep them in there. Uh, I'll, I'll stay on till the end of the time if there are more that come through. Um, otherwise, um, oh, we may not, I, I didn't showcase. There's a feedback option here. So if you do need to submit some feedback, you can do it that way. Um, I believe my email is also in the slide deck. So if you wanna reach out to me or, and I can point you in the direction of others if, if need be, if there are questions that we have about this. Um, but thank you all so much for attending. Um, if we'll look forward to uh, hearing back from you 